So this is a new introduction to my Titanic review and thoughts video. I am re-uploading this with this bit at the start. Longtime subscriber and frequent commenter Arts Cafe, who I believe is Irish himself, pointed out that I failed to underline the and in fact I, I don't know how, but I I actually completely forgot to mention the Irish in in the the video. Uh, I'm I'm very sorry. So um yeah, this is my attempt to try to you know to, to try to address that. So I I found this excellent article which I will also be linking in the description box and I will briefly read. It it helps give you an idea of how bad things were for the Irish back then. You know, the, the British Empire treated the Irish incredibly badly. So, uh, yes, this is directly from the article. The Titanic, which sank on the 15th of April 1912 with a loss of over 1,500 lives, was built, crewed, and traveled on for the most part by Irish. And, yeah, so it's, it's talking about a book. This is an old article. It's from 2000s. But at the time, new book that goes into, let's see, it says, the tragedy, luck, and self-sacrifice self -sacrifice and heroism of the Irish who survived and died on that night to remember. And, yeah, one, one person, Daniel Buckley, 21, survived because Madeline Astor, the young wife of the richest man in the world, threw him a shawl to cover his head as officers attempted to remove male passengers from the lifeboat. His luck deserted him just six years later, when a month before the end of World War I, he was killed by a German bullet. And, the yeah, the majority of the Irish passengers who survived were among the last to leave the ship. They had been held virtual prisoners in third class by officers and crew and saw the final moments of the liner and let's see, yeah and there was a uh, british inqui inquiry into the disaster which was chaired by lord mercy was a whitewash of disgraceful proportions anything that implied criticism of british engineering or british behavior was rejected out of hand and Many of the Irish survivors told harrowing tales of how White Star officers and crew did all they could to prevent survivors bobbing in the freezing sea, gaining access to lifeboats that had launched safely. Thomas McCormick, a 19-year-old co-Longford youth, made a statement that during 80 minutes in the sea, he had tried to get on board two lifeboats. On each occasion, he had been beaten about the head, hands, and shoulders by crewmen until two sisters, Mary and Kate Murphy, pulled him on board and sat on him to prevent him being thrown back into the sea. So, just horrendous stuff. And, again, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't mention... I, 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 I don't know how... It, it just, yeah, but um, I hope this helps to to somewhat make up for it, and I, I will do better in the future. So, yeah, back to the original video. Welcome to my review of 1997's Titanic Review and Thoughts. We are celebrating Women's History Month. So I will be examining this. So, yeah, I absolutely love this movie. There will be some jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's ahistorical, so it sucks. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And, yeah, so I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler. So you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as, then, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So... This movie 
is rated. Oh, there we go. This movie is rated PG-13, and that does make a lot of sense. I, I saw some reviews saying that the first time they watched it, they were, like, small children, and, yeah, honestly, like, some of the, like, obviously the, the Titanic disaster, like, you know, some stuff that happened that's very upsetting, but, but yeah, I could understand watching this as a child. I personally was an adult when I watched it, so I can't really compare. Now, let's see. The, yeah, so I, I either won't swear or it will be very minimal in this video. So I have watched this at least twice. Yeah, I guess this is only my, my second viewing and I got done watching it like just before I hit record. The, the right, yeah, I can briefly go into the first time I watched it was in 2010. And yeah, so the the plot yeah, IMDb covers it well. A 17-year-old aristocrat falls in love with a kind but poor artist above the luxurious, ill-fated RMS Titanic. So, let's see. Yeah, um, you know, basically as soon as this, as I realized this was on Disney+, Plus, I, I decided to do it. And then they actually, they took it away for a while, but then they put it back and here I am. And, yeah, before I get into the details, the technical aspects are very impressive. There's a lot of talent and enthusiasm on display. And that brings us to the writing. So this was written by James Cameron. And let's see. So a lot of people insist that this movie is actually bad. And you're, of course, free to not like it. But for a lot of people, it's just a refusal to engage with a movie that empathizes with women and is, in fact, in part made for women, not men. Some of these people try to give the... Uh, let's see. Yeah, some of the people do try to give the movie a chance, found that it did make them feel, and because we have a culture that says that suppressing emotion is superior to experiencing it, and acknowledging it, you know, a lot of, a lot of these people felt humiliated that something made them feel, and that it was something like this. So they pretended that it was bad, so as to not have to grapple with whether or not maybe it was right for them to feel something for this. Maybe if they watch more movies that empathize with women, it would appeal to them, even be good for them. But, yeah, um... James Cameron, not the very best writer. I, I saw one person comment that something like, I can't believe that James Cameron, the director, would stoop so low as to work with James Cameron, the writer. I would not go that far, but for sure, like, he is better, he's a better director than writer, I would say. Um, yeah, I, I will get into the dialogue later in this video. There, the, the, yeah, I think, yeah, I actually also have some about characterization, but yeah, something that, it's, it's very clear that he you know, he deeply cares about the Titanic. He realizes how big of a tragedy it was, and this movie was in part trying to to sort of, you know, deal with with that. Uh, to to yeah, you know, the, so sometimes in order to understand to to 
process something, we'll, we'll write about it or draw or something, you know. And yeah, this was this was his way of of deal dealing with it, and ultimately the the it doesn't completely do the subject justice. The the but it's 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 difficult. He 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 really tried, and yeah. Um, I think that is what I have for the writing, so... Uh, yeah, it's not really a plot twist heavy movie. It's fairly straightforward. So, that brings us to the direction. So, I have ranked all of James Cameron's movies, worst to best, all except this one. I will update the, these rankings with the with where I put this one at the end of the review itself and I've watched everything that he's written and directed except for Expedition Bismarck, Last Mysteries of the Titanic, Years of Living Dangerously, James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. <clears throat> I would like to watch them but they are not available anywhere that I you know currently have access to. So, the ones he has written but not directed, and I love aspects of all of these. Worst to Best, Dark Fate, Rambo 2, Alita, and Strange Days. And the ones that he has directed, regardless of, you know, whether he's written them or not. Keeping in mind, I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. True Lies, The Abyss. Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Terminator 2, Aliens, Terminator 1. And worst to best ranking all the disaster films I've watched, except for this. Armageddon, Pompeii, Flight of the Phoenix 2004, The Cassandra Crossing, Daylight, The Day After Tomorrow, Twister 2012. And yeah, and, and from here on, the, the rest of these I love. The Core, Ladder 49, The Poseidon Adventure, and The Andromeda Strain. And I certainly, I respect the, the, the Emmerich ones. For sure those have, yeah. Anyway. So, let's see. So, so yeah, for a long time I avoided this movie and eventually I realized I had to. Cameron's talent enough to make this work. And, uh, yeah, I've seen every film he's directed, except for Piranha Part 2, which I understand was taken away from him. And he always does a nice job. Not every single picture of his is equally good, but they're all worth the time. Let's see. And the investment of emotions from the audience, they entertain. He's yet to make the exact same thing twice. Terminator 2 is different from the original notable areas, such as the tone. And, yeah, I don't blindly love all of them. I maintain the quality of the Abyss lies mainly in the gorgeous underwater photography. He never phones it in. He always has something to say, somewhere to go with what he does. I was apprehensive of the idea that this would focus on a sm small group of, of people, in particular the two leads, when this was indeed something that actually did happen and many were killed. However, when you think about it, it needed to be like that. That's what makes the incident in the film have the devastating impact that I think we can all admit it does and you know if you've never watched this movie you might wonder why bother we already know what ended up happening to the Titanic on the off chance that you don't know don't look it up before watching the movie the movie itself goes into the into detail about the fate of the ship quite early on the thing we're invested in is drama between a small group of people not the historical outcome and yes, I maintain, you know, don't don't look it up. The the um ah, what's the word? The thing that Yeah, honestly I think it, it might be really special if you if watching this is the first time you realize what actually happened. Yes, the effects are amazing. The production values offer a new definition of the term grandiose when applied to that aspect. The reason we feel it, though, is that we care about the ones we know to be on the ship. It helps us focus, means we can imagine being there rather than just look at numbers and a visualization of it. 
you know, the the it's impossible for us to put ourselves in the minds of hundreds of people. We can that's that's not really we can we can appreciate that something horrible happened by looking at numbers and looking at a recreation or such or or actually doc, actual documentary stuff, but the stuff that really gets to us is when it's very personal. You know, the the I've I as a as a quick personal example, you know, I was I, I learned as a child that the Vietnam War was horrible, but I struggled to completely you know, grasp it until I went to English class and we were, you know, we were made to read these letters from soldiers, you know, for, yeah, from American soldiers back to home. Uh, you know, that's, that's much, you know, you can put yourself in the mind of, of that. Now, the leads are, uh, the characters are well written, thoroughly developed, credible, all have something to do. Rose is a rather strong woman without it reaching anachronistic levels either. She is not just a wife, she's fleshed out, something that many attempts at female role models neglect to do. The cast is spot on, everyone is well chosen, every single acting performance is flawless. Arguably, this is somewhat black and white in its presentation of them. With that said, they're all convincing and have genuine personality. You know, they're archetypes, not cliches. I've seen some say, oh, you know, they're just, they're cliches. Yeah, I, I disagree. This is one of the greatest disaster movies and epic love dramas in the world of cinema. It is Hollywood and mainstream at its absolute best. Will it please everyone? Perhaps not, and probably not those who refuse to take it on its own terms. It was always clear what approach this took. And also about hype, ignore it. Yes, you read, heard that right. In this case, no, I'll just pretend like you can't hear what everyone is making something out to be and watch what you feel what you feel like as unaffected by popular opinion as you can be. Nothing can survive a viewing by someone who has heard nothing other than positives about it, regardless of its quality. quality. The pacing is marvelous. For a running time of three hours, this is not boring at all. It has fun and humorous moments. Is it sappy? I suppose that's up to the individual to judge. I wouldn't say so. Let's see... So yeah, that was that was my written review from 2010. Now let's see. Yeah, so Wikipedia noticed Titanic's impact on men has also been especially credited. It is considered one of the films that make men cry. With MSNBC's Ian Hodder, Ian Hodder stating that men admire Jack's sense of adventure and his ambitious behavior to win over Rose, which contributes to their emotional attachment to Jack. The film's ability to make men cry was briefly parodied in the 2009 film Zombieland, where character Tallahassee, played by Woody Harrelson, when recalling the death of his young son, states, I haven't cried like that since Titanic. And yeah, you know, some say middle-aged men are not supposed to cry during movies, and a lot of men have tried hiding the, they cried, and let's see, for many men there is a great deal of pressure to avoid expression of female emotions like sadness and fear. From a very young age, males are taught it is inappropriate to cry, and these lessons are often accompanied by a great deal of ridicule when the lessons aren't followed. And let's see. And yeah, and and that's something I've I've seen some some men blame women for this. It's not women who made that decision. It's a patriarchal thing. And in fact, a lot of women, you know, like. Maybe not if it's a complete stranger, but a number of women have a lot of empathy for men who cry if they're friends or if they're romantically involved. Let's see. Yeah, its detractors say that the film is for 15-year-old girls, which is also just like... Even if that were true, which I don't agree that it is, would that be so bad? Like, there's... Yeah, Lindsay Ellis has, has gone into detail about it's ridiculous how... 
I, um, I think it was in her video about her her video. Um, and yes, I realize she's no longer on YouTube, but the the I'm gonna double check. I believe that video is still up. You know, her nostalgia chick content. She she tried to get rid of, but her the one she d did under her own name. Ah, crap! What's it called? Um, I think, yeah, dear Stephanie Meyer, where she examines the the yeah the culture surrounding Twilight bashing and the the yeah she points out you know stuff that is made for teenage boys gets way less hate than stuff for teenage girls but let's see yeah and and you know some some point out the the movie is a film for everyone yeah, and then he says, including teenage boys, because teenage boys are just more important than teenage girls. Just, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, and the film is ranked high by males under the age of 18, matching the ratings for teenage boy targeted films like Iron Man, but it is common for boys and men to deny liking Titanic and... That's it. Yeah, it's this collection of elements, the history, the romance, the action, that made and continues to make Titanic an irresistible proposition for audiences of all ages across the globe. Let's see. It's a great movie for 15-year-old 15, 15 girls. That doesn't mean it's not a great movie for everyone else, too. Let's see. And... Benjamin Wilcock of DVDActive.com did not understand the backlash or the passion and hatred for the film. What really irks me, he said, are those who make nasty stabs at those who do love it. I obviously don't have anything against those who dislike Titanic, but those few who make you feel small and pathetic for doing so, and they do exist, trust me, are way beyond my understanding and sympathy. Ser seriously. Yeah. Let's see. Uh... Right, so some some critic quotes explores explores class gender roles, the dangers of ego and greed. A theme in the movie is proud men overlooking what's right in front of them. For the melodrama of the genre, the acting characterization is spot on. And maybe the melodrama is because it is canonically a story being told. Maybe it's been embellished. I am not sure I've ever seen a disaster movie that I would say, okay, that was really, really good, that wasn't at least partially a melodrama. Like, I don't know why, I guess it's, yeah, it's again that thing of a lot of people think, oh, melodrama, that's for women. If you can point me to a disaster movie that you legitimately think, okay, that's a that's a good movie, That's that deserves being watched by people, that doesn't have any melodramatic aspects, like, and, and, you know, people say, oh, it's just about these two people, disaster movies are always about this small group of, of, you know, people who, yeah, yeah, the, the, um, let's see, I actually wrote something, yeah, like, every disaster movie that's, worth anything it's about interpersonal drama focuses on a small group of major characters rather than trying to build up dozens of people or even more there were 2200 passengers we cannot get to know that many individuals you know certainly not in even three hours now let's see the Kate Winslet manages to make the extremes of her character, the film's only multi-dimensional character, feel like they fit within the one, one person. Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor uh, wa movie was a failed attempt at recreating the success of this, and honestly, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go off on a huge rant about Michael Bay here, but holy crap, did he not understand. Yeah, um... Matt and Trey, the, the people behind South Park and 
other, you know, in, in Team America, they have the song where, where one of the lyrics is, you know, talking about how much Michael Bay missed the mark. And yeah, I think that is, yeah. Let's see, and yeah, so, so, and some about the backlash. Leo was unreasonably hated for being beloved by teen girls at the time and has worked hard to prove that he's not a no-talent pretty boy ever since. And it is, it is ridiculous. Like, he's, he's a very talented actor, clearly. Like, I don't, you know, he's, he's clearly, like, I, I really hope at some point he stops you know, dumping women when they, let's see, what is it, I think, was it age 25 or something like that, you know, in, in general, like, I, I really feel like people should try to date within their own age range, you know, and, and especially someone that, you know, just, yeah, but he is clearly a talented actor, you know, and he he was before this, and actually, apparently, like James Cameron had to convince him, no, this is going to be a romantic lead. You know, you're I'm not gonna you're not gonna get a, a limp or some kind of you know. So so yeah, and the yeah, and and he does legitimately do really well here. But but honestly, like there's a there's a ton of hatred towards young men that appeal a lot to women, and something I've I've seen, you know, when when I was a teenager myself, I saw other teenage boys who were like, I was taught not to be like that. I was taught to not show emotion, like boy bands and you know, um, male leads in romantic movies and such. I was taught that I can't, you know, I have to be, my masculinity has to be a certain way. I can't, I'm not allowed to look like Ricky Martin, but the girls love it. And, and they would get mad at these guys and the girls who love them instead of saying, oh, hey, wait, who is it that made this decision? And again, it's, it's patriarchy. And, right, another critic noted, before Avatar, James Cameron did a good job balancing spectacle and story. Titanic was the first time the spectacle didn't win out. See, of course, the movie is a melodrama. The Titanic sinking in real life was melodramatic. And, let's see, I think there was some other... There we go, yeah. Okay, so this guy, wow. Um, if when you see this film you believe it's credible, which is also just like right off the bat, aspects of it are extremely credible and realistic. Anyway, if when you see this film you believe it's credible, God bless you and your unfortunate offspring with their damaged gene pool. If this guy is anyone's doctor, make sure he didn't sterilize you without your consent. That was, that was not a necessary place to take this conversation. Holy crap, dude. Let's see. James Cameron's 194-minute, $200 million film of, of the tragic voyage is, is in the tradition of the great Hollywood epics. It is flawlessly crafted, intelligently constructed, strongly acted, and spellbinding. So the opening does a good job of, like, the the... Yeah, the very opening has you know some of the some of the romantic and and really melodramatic aspects, and then it also has some of the modern cynicism that you know I don't know I guess maybe we're in a, a bit of a better place now during the nineties, a lot of cynicism you know and James Cameron was basically acknowledging. I get it. Everybody's so cynical and so above it, so so beyond it these days. Can we can we just? That's not my movie. That I'm not gonna make a cynical, you know, nasty movie about. You know, no. This is this is about feeling the emotion. 
So I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I think the ending is great. Now I do have a, a, a critic quote. You know, some I, I I took various critic quotes and and basically com combined and rewrote them to to very quickly get the point across. So they they said, and I quote, "Wah wah wah." Okay, so I'm like just slightly kidding here, but holy crap, do a lot of people hate this movie's ending, and it really is like it made you feel. It made you feel something. You resent that, and so you whine about. Like there are movies with bad endings. This isn't one of them. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing, and let's see. So. Um, this tries to, to fit in as many as it can of the historical facts that were known at the time. You know, some things have come out since that they just didn't, you know, you can only work with the best information you have at the time. You can't look into the future. So the, but, but yeah, it gets a ton of detail about the people we know were there. It gets just like the the yeah the realism of the the details about the the ship and just and the disaster yeah in incredible that brings us to the characters now the movie makes it very clear there's a huge contrast between first class and third class first class board the ship comfortably and stay in luxury third class have to go through public humiliating health checks looking for head lice and it's literally their backbreaking labor that gets and keeps the ship moving at all i do think the film doesn't consistently nail this at times we're admiring how amazing the ship and the maiden voyage are without weighing that against all the people suffering to make both happen. This is, of course, a general issue in modern society. Not only its media, but it would be amazing if the movie was able to better address it. And James Cameron is known for pushing very hard, you know, like some, some of the messages that he communicates in Terminator 2. Like, I myself have argued about several of them. I do really respect, like, he... That was not, like, broadly accepted wisdom at the time. You know, he he put messages in that movie that, like, the, the um, yeah, if, if the movie didn't have the action spectacle, and if it wasn't so, you know, like, culturally deemed appropriate for young men to get really into, that movie would probably be really widely hated for those messages, especially for how some of them really, like, they're, they're very much about women and mothers, you know, but, yeah, he actually, he, he pushed those message, messages, uh, you know, they're, they're not only in the, yeah, if you want, if you want a good laugh, try looking up the original, the the um, I think it's probably on here on IMDb. Um, let's see if you yeah it's it's under alternate ending Terminator Two Judgment Day special director's cut or future coda will also get the yeah it's it's wild that he actually he filmed that he thought that was gonna be the ending like if you listen I think it's on the commentary track he said. He didn't really have a backup ending, so they basically they, they had to go and steal a shot from another part of the movie and just record some just yeah, he thought that was gonna be the ending, you know. So he's not he doesn't really hold back on the on the messages. So yeah, it's a little disappointing here that it you know, it, it is really nice that he does clearly care. You know, I, I do realize, you know, in his youth, you know, certainly while he was making the Terminator, the first movie, first Terminator movie, he was struggling with uh, poverty also. But, you know, that was 13 years before this movie came out, at least. So, yeah, you know, some, some people um, without, I'm not going to dive into details, but certainly Drew Carey, you know, when 
when you watch the early episodes of the Drew Carey show, his like he was actually empathizing with workers. He was himself, you know. He didn't have a lot of money at the time, but then later in the show, as he got a lot more money, his messaging started to become very conservative and very just, yeah. So it is admirable that James Cameron, really, even even to this day, you know, he had, there, are, there are issues with his movies, but Avatar 2 does have empathy with, you know, some very disadvantaged people, so I really respect that about him. And James Cameron finally cast Jeanette Goldstein as an alien, just as she always wanted from him. You know, this is like the third time he cast her. And I am just going to make absolutely sure that I have this right. Um, let's see. Yes. Um... And now I just gotta look up how to pronounce his name because I don't want to mess it up. The Welsh actor Yon Griffith is apparently how you pronounce it. Was actually in this, and I—I I mean, I don't know, but is this maybe what got him the role of Horatio Hornblower for the Hornblower series of television films? Because that was after this, and. He is an, a naval person in this, so... But yeah, he's... I always tell people, don't judge him based on the Fantastic Four movies. I think it's because he's struggling with the American accent, and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're struggling... If you're, fo if you're putting all your focus on making sure your accent is right, then you forget... That, then it can be... You know, some people can't also... I'm sure, I'm sure some people can, but you know we see we see a simple similar thing in the first X Men movie where Halle Berry is struggling with this you know American uh, African accent that she she isn't really able to give that strong of a performance in that first movie, and it really like she was incredibly talented at that even even at that time I'm I'm sure she still is I haven't really watched any of her recent stuff I don't think. But yeah, if you if you can look past Fantastic Four, try giving Young Griffith a chance. You know, he doesn't have a huge, huge amount of screen time in this, but try to watch at least some of just the first Hornblower movie, and he will blow you away. He's so much more talented than he appears to in the the Fantastic Four movies. Yeah. And let's see. So, so yes, Kate Winslet stars as Rose DeWitt Bucater. I forget how they pronounce it, but I think it's Bucater. And let's see. yeah, Cameron said Winslet had the thing you had the thing you look for. There was a quality in her face, in her eyes. He just knew people would be ready to go the distance with her. And, yeah, a 17-year-old girl, originally from Philadelphia, forced into an engagement to 30-year-old Cal Hockley, so she and her mother, Ruth, can maintain their high-class status after her father's death had left the family debt-ridden. And, let's see, Winslet said of her character, she has a lot to give, and she has, she's got a very open heart. She wants to explore and adventure the world, but she feels that's not going to happen. Now, Gwyneth Paltrow, Winona Ryder, Claire Danes, Gabrielle Anwar, and Reese Witherspoon had been considered for the role. I would definitely say they could have done a really great job. Uh, you know, Claire Danes, I have to wonder if maybe... No, wait, no. Apparently, Kate Winslet was cast before... Um, before DiCaprio, but apparently Claire Danes did not really love working with DiCaprio on Romeo plus Juliet, which came out the year before this. So that, I can't rule out that might have been a, a factor. And it's, you know, she, um, Kate Winslet and Leo got along great. It's, you know, back then, I don't, I, I don't know about still, but I certainly back then he was, you know, he would make jokes you know, off camera, that the, the, yeah, you know, as a, there's a, 
um, he, like if he if he has to, you know, if the script says he has to kiss, uh, you know, an, an actress, he's gonna try to eat something that's gonna give him really bad breath just to mess with her, you know, that kind of thing. Claire Danes was not a fan of it. She thought he was really immature. Kate Winslet really did. She she completely was on the the same wavelength, and they both did did jokes. So that's. But yeah, Gwyneth Paltrow, for sure, I could I could see that, and she was also a big, you know, romantic female lead in the in some of the '90s. So yeah, uh, yeah, Winona Ryder. I I gotta say, I think Winona Ryder is better in stuff like. I'm not gonna claim that the the entire movie is great, but I think she is really well suited for stuff like. The, um, ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on the, uh, you gotta say his name three times. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find it real quick, or it's gonna bug me for the rest of the video. Winona Ryder. Right, yeah, she's great in Edward Scissorhands, and also... Oh, she's in the new Frankenweenie. That makes a lot of sense. It really is. Like, they seem perfect for each other, her and, and Tim Burton. Beetlejuice. I think she's excellent in Beetlejuice. I, th I think she does really well as this sort of, not as, not not quite mainstream girl, but the, the girl who has, like, you know, she's a little, a, you know, a tiny bit unusual, kind of, the the... You know, I, th I think she, yeah, I think she's really great at, at that kind of thing. Claire Danes, I think the only thing I've seen her in that was from this time was Romeo plus Juliet. But yeah, for sure, she could have. Yeah, it might also have been a little boring to have, like, two big romantic epics in a row. Like, two years in a row with the same two stars that just, yeah. Gabrielle Anwar, so let's see, this was around the time of... The, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. I'll, um, I'll have it momentarily. Okay, Brielle. There we go. Uh, The Scent of a Woman. This was around that time. Oh, right, and Three Musketeers, which I did recently. Um, yeah, she, she definitely could have, could have done it. You know, with with her, I, I do think, you know, the most interesting thing I've seen her play was definitely Fiona Glenan in Burn Notice. But that was, you know, that show started ten years after this. But yeah, she definitely, she has that quality of, like, the, the romantic lead. And Reese Witherspoon, so this would be around the time of stuff like Election and Cruel Intentions. Yeah. That, that also, overall, I am really glad that it ended up being Kate Winslet. I think she did such a phenomenal job. Um, yeah, overall, I'm not sure any of the others, as talented as they all are, I don't think they could have quite done it. Let's see. Yeah, they all turned it down, and Winslet campaigned heavily for the role, sent Cameron daily notes from England, which led Cameron to invite her to Hollywood for auditions. As for DiCaprio casting director Molly Finn originally brought her to Cameron's attention when looking for a rose. Cameron described the character as an Aubrey Hepburn type and was initially uncertain about casting Winslet. Even after her screen test impressed him, after she screen tested with DiCaprio, Winslet was so thoroughly impressed with him that she whispered to Cameron, he's great, even if you don't pick him, pick me, pick him. Winslet sent Cameron a single rose with a car sign from your rose and lobbied him by phone. You don't understand, she pleaded one day when she reached him by mobile phone in his Humvee. I am Rose. I don't know why you're even seeing anyone else. Her persistence, as well as her talent, eventually convinced him to cast her in the role. And she really is absolutely spot on. She's introduced disinterested in wealth and luxury and soon after to admire the work of Picasso, at the time poor but talented, Cal didn't mind buying art that she loves that he doesn't, since it was inexpensive. And we meet her at age 84, before going back to age 17, ensuring that we see the person rather than only ogle her. You know, when we meet her at 84, she has had a full life. 
the the you know yeah this is she's yeah the the so so you know the majority of people meet her as a as a person you know elsewhere in his work james cameron also introduces his female leads in non-sexual ways despite making action horror flicks during the 80s he says all his films are love stories considers this one the one where he got it right and yeah um i i really really appreciate uh, the the idea I, I realize not every movie can do something like that but i really appreciate when they do it and I I had actually forgotten. I've, I've personally never had a problem seeing women as as full people, but I had forgotten that it took that that it made that effort also. So, yeah. And uh, I mean, I suppose you see a drawing of her at age seventeen, but when you see you know, when you hear her voice and see her face moving, it's at age eighty four. Or wait. Sir. I can't believe I... 84 years later. So, yeah, 101. Wow. I... Yeah. It's because of the line, the famous line, it's been 84 years. That's why that number stuck in my head. Anyway. Leonardo DiCaprio plays Jack Dawson. Cameron said he needed the cast to feel like they feel they were really on the Titanic to relive its liveliness, so take that energy, give it to Jack, an artist who is able to have his heart soar. Jack is portrayed as an itinerant poor orphan from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, who has traveled the world, including Paris. He wins two third-class tickets for the Titanic in a poker game. He's on the ship because of pure luck, which is sadly frequently the only way poor people can get ahead Many suffer despite skill and working hard. I, I should say, not not for everyone, but for, for very many, it's, yeah. It travels with his friend Fabrizio. He's attracted to Rose at first sight. And let's see. Cameron's original choice for the role was River Phoenix. However, he died in 1993. Though established actors like Matthew McConaughey, Chris O'Donnell, Billy Crudup, and Stephen Dorff were considered, Cameron felt they were too old for the part of a 20-year-old. That is true. Other than age, I do think they would have done well. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure that... I did. Over, overall, I'm, I'm really glad that it was uh, Cruz. Uh, yeah, Caprio. Tom Cruise was interested, but his asking price was too high. He could definitely also have, have done it. But I, I do think DiCaprio was the, was the best choice. Cameron considered Jared Leto for the role, but Leto refused to audition. So he was kind of a jerk even back then. He could have done it, I do think. But, yeah. Jeremy Sisto did a series of screen tests with Winslet and three other actresses vying for the role of Rose. DiCaprio, 21 years old at the time, was brought to Cameron's attention by casting director Molly Finn. Initially, he did not want the role and refused to read his first romantic scene. Cameron said he read it once then started goofing around and I could never get him to focus on it again. But for one split second, a shaft of light came down from the heavens and lit up the forest. Cameron strongly believed in DiCaprio's acting ability and told him, Look, I'm not going to make this guy brooding and neurotic. I'm not going to give him a tick and a limp and all the things you want. Cameron envisioned the character as being like those played by James Stewart or Gregory Peck. Although Jack Dawson was a f fictional character in Fairview... Uh, let's yeah, in Fairview Cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where 121 victims were buried, there is a grave labeled J. Dawson. The real J. Dawson was Joseph Dawson, the trimmer in the engine room. It wasn't until after the movie came out that we find out there was a J. Dawson gravestones. The film's producer, John Lando, in an interview. Now, let's And, you know, the way that he treats Rose, at least some of the time, can really serve as a great example to straight young men who aren't sure how to be around women that they're attracted to. Billy Zane plays Calden Hockley, often referred to as Cal. 
Rose's arrogant, snobbish 30-year-old fiancé, who's the heir to a Pittsburgh steel fortune. Let's see. The part was originally offered to Matthew McConaughey, and Rob Lowe was, has also gone on the record as having pursued it. I don't think anybody could have nailed it as well as, as Billy Zane. The movie makes it clear that Cal thinks of Rose not as a person, but as a possession, something to flaunt. He's introduced impressed with how luxurious and big the Titanic is, throwing his money around to get special treatment. That's what he values. He is so much fun to hate. Like, the way he speaks, the thing he says, the, his values, or lack thereof, Billy Zane nails it. Like, just completely... Yeah, he's he just... He's such a great antagonist. Just, yeah. Now, let's see. Um, yeah, I'm gonna... Uh, Briefly, so so Francis Fisher plays Ruth DeWitt Bacater, Rose widowed mother. I really appreciate that, you know, the the yeah. More from Wikipedia. Like many aristocratic passengers portrayed in the film, her disposition is elitist and frivolous, but she does have empathy for Rose. She just, you know, basically puts herself above Rose, uh, which is, sadly, you know, some, some parents do that, and, yeah, the, the class is more important to her. Let's see, and Gloria Stewart plays the, the 101 Rose, and, uh, yeah, she, she narrates the film in a modern-day framing device, and Cameron stated, in order to see the present and the past, I decided to create a fictional survivor who's close to 101 years. She connects us in a way through history. And I really, you know, I've seen some people say we don't need the modern stuff. We can just go directly to the past. I I think Cameron made the, the right decision. I'm not just blind. I, I do have issues with some of his, yeah. I have a number of issues with Terminator 2, for example. I've done multiple videos talking about them, but the, um, yeah, uh, let's see, yeah, and, and in real life she was 87, so she had to be made up to look older for the role, <clears throat> and... Yeah, and my casting director found her. She was sent out on a mission to find retired actresses from the golden age of the 30s and 40s. Cameron said he did not know who Stewart was. Faye Ray was also considered for the role. Stewart was just so into it and so lucid and had such a great spirit. And I saw the connection between her spirit and Winslet's spirit. I saw the genre de vivre in both of them, and I thought the audience would be able to make that cognitive leap that it's the same person. So yeah, you know, just recently I did a review of the um, the second Shazam movie, and while I think some people are are going too far, some you know certainly an argument could be an argument could be made that the teenage and adult versions of the character of Billy Batson, you know, because the two different actors play the roles in their very specific ways, you know, some, some people feel like it's, you know, they don't seem like it's the same character. With Rose, the two different versions really do, it really does seem like it is the, the same person. And Bill Paxton, R.I.P., as Brock Love. Oh, actually, yeah, um, I haven't been looking them up, but I imagine Gloria Stewart. Yeah, Gloria Stewart, R.I.P. Um, but, but yeah, Bill Paxton as Brock Lovett, a treasure hunter looking for the heart of the ocean in the wreck of the Titanic in the present. Time and funding for his expedition are running out. And let's see. I think that is going to be about... Right. Um, Danny Nucci plays Fabrizio, Jack's Italian best friend, who boards the RMS Titanic with him after Jack wins two tickets in a poker game. And let's 
I think Cameron is trying to be inclusive, but the character, due to the melodramatic nature of the film, comes off as a bit of a cartoon, like, oh, that silly ethnic person, isn't he a hoot? And it's just, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. David Warner plays Spicer Lovejoy, and he is Cal's English valet and bodyguard, and he is also very, very, like, you know, he's basically the right-hand man, and the, the, he, you know, the thing, the, the bad things that Cal wants to happen, you know, Lovejoy is hypothetically the person who would be carrying them out, and, yeah, we, we absolutely hate him, and it's, it's, like, Warner is a very charismatic person, so, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I can imagine he's probably played other antagonist roles, but you just, yeah, he's he's so good. You really really hate him. And let's see, I think that yeah, um, Kathy Bates plays Margaret Molly Brown. Brown is looked down upon by other first class women, including Ruth, as vulgar and new money. She's, uh, let's see, yeah, she's friendly to Jack. She was dubbed the unsinkable Molly Brown by historians. Let's see, and, right, so, so the, um, yeah, uh, Reba McIntyre was offered the role, had to turn it down because it conflicted with her touring schedule. And, you know, Kathy Bates, like, I, I feel bad that so often when people think Kathy Bates, they think Misery, which is not the only role that she's, you know, she is so good. Of everything I've seen her in, she's really, really good in. And just, yeah, this, this is one of the, you know, like, she... This is a character that could easily be incredibly obnoxious and irritating because she takes up a lot of space. You know, she is loud and brash. And we, like, even people who don't like the movie, a lot of them still like her character because she's just, she's so much fun. And it is, like, it's that kind of thing of, like, we have an easier time accepting if someone is like brash and and broad, if it is like, it's clear that it's coming from a real place. Like it's not put on. It comes to her naturally to be this kind of person. And she actually isn't like, yeah, you know, she can, she can be vulgar, but she's not like mean to people who aren't, like, she, she has a couple of choice comments, but it's to people who are being really, really... But like, she calls out Cal, for example. Uh, you know, so the... the Yeah. You know, she, she really is a, a just... Yeah. Um, honestly, if, if the... If there is any one character other than Rose that I would really love to see in other stuff, like, um, yeah, give, give us the, the Molly Brown cinematic universe, have her in all kinds of situations, just, although I realize that might, like, since the, you know, she was, she did actually exist, you know, you, you have to be careful how you, but, but just, yeah, she's, She's such a, a fun character. And I think that is going to be about the ones I'm going to talk about. The the IMDB has like a ton of the the yeah long list. I'm not gonna get into but but yeah. Lots of really talented, the, huh, 
Anna Svelk, who filmed a documentary about the film sets for the Titanic Historical Society, makes a cameo appearance in the film as a Swedish immigrant whom Jack Dawson meets when he enters his cabin. And... Yeah, you know, I, I do really appreciate it acknowledges how many different immigrants, you know, the... the so, so yeah, I've mentioned uh, Italian... Let's see, yeah, Italian, Swedish, there's also Czech, and actually even a, a few Middle Eastern uh, Muslims. So, so yeah, I really appreciate the, the acknowledgement, because these are people who've often been erased from, from history, and, and, you know, people are like, ah, oh, they don't want to work. They did a lot of work, it just wasn't shared with, with future generations, it wasn't acknowledged. By people. So that brings us to the dialogue. So there's definitely some very cheesy, very and some very exposition-y lines. Dialogue is not Cameron's strongest suit. The cast do their best, and there are some deeply memorable deliveries. And it is worth noting the on IMDb there are 146 entries in the IMDb quote in the, in the memorable quotes section and I don't think any of them were entered by people who think oh these are terrible which is sometimes the the case but yeah and I'm not going to claim that all of them are like amazing but many of them are really really good but but for sure like there are times There are times where where something um, something big is happening, and Cameron is clearly concerned that some people are going to be confused. So he has a character just say, "This is what's happening, and if we want to be safe, we have to do this." And if that happened once, it would be like. Okay, that was... Okay, I guess he felt like it, but it happens more than once. Let's go with that. It happens more than once. It is There is a non-zero amount of times that this appears in the film, and it is... Like, if you're super into the emotion, and I, I will say on both of these viewings, I, I was... It's, it's not gonna, like, really necessarily stand out because you just internalize what's being said you know you're just like oh that's what's happening this is what they have to do to survive okay you know but it's not the most subtle and it does it's not as bad as the stuff during the the some of the later hospital scenes in terminator 2 but it is still like I, I wish that he had, um, um, honestly, I think a lot of them could have been just removed, but he's maybe concerned that the audience, he's more concerned that the audience will be confused, lost, than that we will be really annoyed by these lines. So, yeah, I honestly, I, th I think, uh, you know... His movies are not ones that really call for, like, extensive re-editing, but I would like to see, like, fan edits that have... It is possible they exist. I, I'm not... I don't look everywhere on the internet. But, yeah, you know, fan edits of some of these movies that take out the really exposition -y lines. Like, you need them in the first Terminator because a lot of what's being described is not something that we're gonna just pieced together by context clues, like it is here. Now, the cinematography is very, very strong, and let's, oh, let's just get the name of the... Yes, it was handled by Russell Carpenter, who... Let's see... Yeah, he also shot True Lies, Ant-Man, and Avatar The Way of Water. So, yeah, the... 
Cameron is a, a fan of his his work of the work they do together he he's been working since 1978 and yeah is indeed still working today he's set to yeah he also shot avatar 3 which is currently in post-production and yeah he has 53 completed credits as cinematographer and yeah his his photography really captures the scope incredibly well and the let's see um yeah it's it's a um, and he did he did action movies during the the 90s and and such so so yeah his his camera really captures the 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 scope of the Titanic and like you know it's I I realize it's not necessarily the the favorite thing of all cinematographers to do but one of the things he has to do is make sure that Rose and Jack look stunning and he nails it you know it's it's very much the the yeah and that brings us to the editing which was sent by Conrad Buff the third James Cameron and Richard a Harris a Harris and let's see the so yeah Conrad Buff has 37 editing credits and is in total and is still working today Richard has 43 last time he worked was in 2010. Um, not offhand. Right, and yeah, uh, Richard also edited Terminator 2, True Lies. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's apparently it for the James Cameron stuff. And Conrad also edited... Let's see. Uh, yeah, he edited a bunch of stuff during the 80s and 90s, and he was also one of the editors on Terminator 2 and True Lies. So, yeah, clearly Cameron really appreciated their work editing those two movies to, to bring them back for something so big. And, yeah, they, they do a really solid job, all three editors and there are some really really like a lot of the the editing is fairly straightforward but there are a couple of times where it really takes a risk and like it paid off like they are really really amazing during the the parts of like the the two falling in love it's you know, it, it lets stuff breathe, but during, you know, when, when there's, like, a threat, it's, it's very propulsive. It really keeps things moving. And the, let's see, yes, that brings us to the budget. So this was... Oh right, I put it I put it in here. That's why I can't find it right now. There we go. Usually I have that in the same file, but there was so much for this one that I ended up making multiple files because this is a movie that has been written about a lot. So the yes, here we go. The budget was 200 million dollars now the box office was only 2.249 million oh no, 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 no a billion 2.249 billion dollars this is what you might call a successful movie and it's no wonder because like yeah some people didn't want to admit that they watched it 
but everybody watched it. Everybody watched it, and a lot of people watched it multiple times, and it's no wonder, because it really does, like, the emotion and the spectacle, and just, yeah, it's a, it's a really strong experience. And the, let's see, that brings us to the filming. So this was, right, they actually did go out on location for some of this, for, to the Titanic wreck at the, at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And yeah, some of them were shot in studio in Mexico. There was some location shooting in California, Canada, Mexico. Let's see. Yeah, and and the engine some at least some of the engine room scenes were shot on an actual ship, the SS Jeremiah O'Brien. And yeah, a lot of it was shot. They actually did have a massive like water tank and a a really big like recreation of the ship itself. Like it's yeah, it's pretty wild that they did. And and yeah, Cameron like he actually managed to to convince the studio to to let him do certain things that were expensive because he convinced them it's going to really it's going to make the movie better. You know, and yeah, it's he's really really good at at you know, working within the system to get something really impressive and and there's actually let's see if I can find the um, let's see yeah um, yeah the cost of filming Titanic eventually began to mount finally reached 200 million a bit over 1 million per minute of screen time Fox executives panic suggested an hour of specific cuts. Holy crap. From the three-hour film, they argued the extended length would mean fewer showings, thus less revenue, even though long epics are more likely to help directors win Oscars. And it, again, like I said, it made money. So, you know, but yeah. Cameron refused, telling Fox, you want to cut my movie? You're going to have to fire me. You want to fire me? You're going to have to kill me. See, I would never believe that someone who would literally say that, that that's like, that's not contested. That's not like something someone came, no, no, that's like, apparently he did actually say that, you know, I would never believe someone who would actually say that in real life would direct melodramatic movies. That's just crazy talk. The action is very, very engaging and really well choreographed, like, I already mentioned that it's heavily based on what they knew at the time, you know, so some of it is not realistic based on what we know today, but based on what they knew at the time, and yeah, like the, there's a, um, you know, some of the best disaster movies, even if you only have one disaster, you can try to come up with a lot of individual aspects of the disaster, a lot of different, you know, yeah, and yeah, they managed to come up with a lot of, of deeply compelling stuff that has to be avoided and escaped and, and such, and just, yeah. The music was handled by James Horner, R.I.P. And you know, I've I've heard some some criticisms of his work. You know, he's he's said to be very. Um, let's see. You know, he he borrows from him from his other own work a lot. And I'm not going to claim that that isn't that that didn't happen here, but he did an amazing job. Um, I don't know if it's super obvious, but behind me, I do own the the soundtrack to this movie. And let's 
Dostoevsky. I will 100% grant that the Celine Dion song was overplayed at the time. If you listen to it independently of that, it's not really a bad song. Like, it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, like, I... I you know, I'll, keeping in mind, we're, we're grading on a curve here. We're talking about pop songs that are meant to you know, big movies, like, I, I think I like this one better than the one for, what was it called? All for one, no, one for all and all for love for the, the, um, Three Musketeers movie from 93, and, I don't know, I guess maybe overall the, um, the one for the Robin Hood, the, the, Kevin Costner, Robin Hood. That one might be a better song, although I really despise the performer. It's called Brian Adams for apparently being like really like he he can't handle criticism. So a bunch of the reviews were removed from the internet. Just ridiculous. Personally, I don't remember the Celine Dion song. He hearing it everywhere in '97. I'm not sure if it was everywhere here in Denmark at the time. Maybe it's my lack of social life that means that I wasn't at any of the places it was played. I suppose maybe if you still can remember it being everywhere, it's possible you won't be able to divorce it from that context. And that does mean it was a partially bad experience for people watching it in theaters at the time. The overall score is amazing, highly effective. Like, it's worth listening to independently of watching the movie. And according to Wikipedia, Titanic Live was a live performance of James Horner's original score by a 130-piece orchestra, choir, and Celtic musicians accompanying a showing of the film. In April 2015, it premiered at the Royal Albert Hall, London, where the 2012 3D re-release had premiered. Right, and I, I have not watched the 2012 3D. Like, when I saw that they were re-releasing it in 2012, like, I was like, why would I watch a post-conversion of a movie shot 15 years ago that wasn't shot for being in 3D? I would probably have gone to see it if it had been in 2D, but I don't, I do not like 3D, you know, I, I also didn't watch Phantom Menace in, in 3D, which was like 2012, I forget, did I still like the prequels in 2012? I think I was okay with Phantom Menace at least, but I just, I, I don't like when, when you do it so, just, yeah, just, just re-release the original, it, it's just, yeah, anyway, and, right, so some, some critic quotes about the score, the main aspect I love in this film is James Horner's haunting score that was a key ingredient in the film's success, it is simply perfect, the music intensifies the emotions, the love theme is beautiful, perfect score by the great late James Horner, Brilliant music, somber music, masterfully ties together James Cameron's work. Let's see, the music was lovely. One person did say, so I, I respect, you know, this is their opinion. Composer James Horner turns in a huge pile of cliched faux romantic gloop, all the more travesty if you remember he did the rousing score of Aliens. I suppose, overall, the score of Aliens is. I don't know if it's better, but uh, overall it's probably more to my liking, but that is because that's more the kind of movie that I, you know, but the music for this was really, really, uh, really, really fits. And apparently, ah, crap, I forget if it was James Horner himself, but someone was really unhappy, maybe it was James Cameron, was really unhappy that the, the Celine Dion song, My Heart Will Go On, you know, it uses some notes from the the actual, you know, the love theme from the, the movie itself. And, yeah, James Cameron was not a fan of that, but they, you know, yeah, they they managed to, to get it made. And, yeah, really, like, if you just sit down and listen to it, 
today, it's fine. It's not some, you know, there, there's a lot of pop music that is terrible, but that isn't one of them. It just, you know, I, I guess you're lucky that you apparently haven't heard or don't remember all the really terrible pop music. Yeah, I, I remember the 90s. Like, I was, I was old enough to care about music during the 90s, and there was some real garbage on the, on the airwaves that just, yeah. Let's see. And, you know, obviously, you're not gonna like it if you just don't like that kind of music, and that's fine, but then, you know, it fits this, this movie. So, pacing. Like with the Avatar movies, it probably would be better served with a miniseries. And no, I haven't watched the 1996 Titanic miniseries. It is not currently on Disney Plus. If it, you know, if it's put there and it's like, it was, I, I haven't really looked. But if it was like well received, checking. No, no, it is not currently on Disney Plus. If it, if it's eventually put on there. And, like, it was well-received by, by critics and, and viewers, and or viewers. I will strongly consider it. But, yeah, you know, it would, for, for this and the two Avatar movies, and uh, let's be honest, probably the f upcoming Avatar movies as well, it would have been great for, it to be mini for them to be miniseries, more time to characterize everyone, but he makes movies for the theater, not for people to only be able to watch at home, and unlike Avatar, this one doesn't feel like it's rushing through a lot of world building just to finally get to the story that he wants to tell. I think that's one of my biggest problems with the first Avatar. That just... I, I wish, like... It's not that he's never had anything to do with, like, TV production. Like, there was the, the um, Dark Angel. And depending on which source... I see, I, I, like, apparently some people say that he tried to watch a little of the Terminator show, and then it didn't get, you know, and, and it didn't really capture his interest or, or something, but other people say that he was part of making the show and he worked on every single episode, or something, you know, so I haven't really been able to, to find out for sure, but yeah, like, honestly... A season of TV show leading up to the first Avatar movie, getting out all of the world building out of the way, instead of just so much of that movie just being stuff told to us. Just, yeah. Anyway, this one does much, much better. And honestly, like, I had actually forgotten, like, it does legitimately expect you to be aware. And I guess in 97, a lot of people were still super aware um but but yeah you know uh let's see the the um, a couple of things that the let's see yeah i mean i don't think that the the movie itself makes a at, le at least not very early on like make makes a big thing out of the fact that it was a british ship you know, the, the, there's a lot of focus on, oh, it's going to America, you know, and the, yeah, first class and third class people on the ship in this movie are, ex you know, excited to get to America or had feelings about getting to America at least. And yeah, um, you know, that's a, that's a thing. It does mention, the movie does mention how many passengers were on and... There's some details about the disaster itself. Let's see. And uh, yeah, I think they do mention that it was, you know, 1912. And, but, but yeah, there, there were things about the ship that the movie doesn't spend forever, you know, establishing for the audience. And yeah, I, I think back then, and, and certainly... Oh, let's see. I guess the internet wasn't big, but it was like you could look up details. And the movie doesn't leave stuff that you don't need to know. Like it doesn't it doesn't 
the things that you absolutely need to know will be will appear in the movie at some point. Now, let's see. So yeah, um, the movie is three hours and seven minutes long without end credits, three hours, 15 and a half long with them. And it, uh, I, can, I can understand why some people feel that it's overlong. When I look at some of the stuff that, when I, when I read about stuff that was cut, I agree with the cuts made. I don't think that they really needed to cut more. Now, if I had to say, I think maybe if you watch the first 45 minutes, if if by then you don't care about what happens next, you know, you it's it's okay to stop watching in, in my opinion. I don't think the rest of the movie is really going to by then it's set up the characters that are that, that we care the most about. So the best elements of the film it's a it's a tie between the subtext, the emotional engagement, seeing Cameron tackle something so different from all that he'd done before, and just yeah. The worst aspect, in my opinion, is there is too little diversity. It does have, have, have empathy for white women, which is more than what can be said for a lot of Western cinema, and the lower class, which have been attacked by conservatives through the policies they fight for. I do think that the movie might have been even better if Jack was not white. I figure he isn't because Cameron was worried that would be one step too far, as far as taking chances with the film, you know, genre, politics, and such. I do think that Cameron is, in general, too married to the idea that his leads need to be white. He fares at least slightly better on how frequently his leads are female. The closest he comes is probably the abyss's Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, who is, like, almost Mediterranean Latina. Let's see. But, but yeah, I, I think it would have been even stronger... And, you know, I acknowledge, I, I realize there were poor white people also. And the movie does make clear not only white people were poor and hardworking. You know, there were hardworking people that didn't look like that. But they're not given a lot of screen time. Like, I actually forgot some of the, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the, some of the different groups that appear in this. I had forgotten some of them because they don't appear for very long. And... Yeah, I just I I think that the movie could have done more. You know, I th I think most people like even if not consciously, they probably subconsciously take away. You know, the Titanic would not have been able to, to you know sail and sail as fast as it did for as long as it did if not for all these you know lower class people, but considering that the romantic lead is supposed to be lower class, making him pretty and white really does feel like... And it is also like, I don't know, I guess maybe teenagers are, are shallow enough, but like a lot of people... And, okay, film is a visual medium, it is very... But, like, in real life, you know, a lot of people are actually more... You know, a lot of people fall in love with someone that isn't conventionally attractive, but interesting, you know, and that I feel like that's what, you know, James Cameron was frustrated that, um, that DiCaprio wanted him, his character to have a limp or, or some kind of, now, and the film does make at least one real life heroic person look like he put the safety and survival of himself above that of others. James Cameron has since apologized for this, as he should. Would have been great if he didn't put it in the film at all, because it is, and it is, it is, I don't, I don't know why he put it in the film, because the movie already features fictional characters, so why didn't he make one of the fictional characters do, I, I get why he wanted, you know, the, the, and the scene is compelling, but he didn't have to, like, drag the reputation of a long dead person who was heroic, you know, in, in this, it's just, I, I, I don't know why he did that. When, when you think about how much of the movie is him, like, 
it was important to him to get as much right as he could. And not only about the ship, but also the people. Now, um, ultimately, it doesn't ruin the movie, but... Yeah, I, I... I think also, if, if like, the... If he wasn't still doing, you know, Avatar, The Way of Water, it features indigenous characters, but a lot of the cast are still white people. You know, it's it's just, yeah, I, I really, really wish that he would try to get past this. I, I realize, you know, during the 80s, it was very, very difficult to get movies, you know, like, some, some of the movies actually do feature, like, really, really talented minority, mem you know, ethnic minorities, but then you look at, you know, and they, they didn't have much of a career after, even though they were really great in, you know, the one or two movies that they got to star in, and just, so, so, I get that he was probably, certainly when he made this, was worried that he would be taking too many chances, but the Avatar movies, come on, they're they're going to get made, whether anyone wants it or not. Like I said in my Avatar 2 review, I do think he he improved from the first one in some ways. In some ways he he didn't. In some ways he got slightly worse. But you know, it's yeah, it's gonna happen. So you know, hopefully the, the future ones are even better, but yeah, you know, the, the, some of the cast for the second movie are going to be back for the third and possibly even fourth, so, you know, and, and like I mentioned earlier, Avatar 3 has been filmed, you know, they're, they're, they're in post-production, so there's not really anything he can do about it at this point, so, and, you know, it's not like nobody's calling it out either, anyway. But no, you know, the movie isn't bad because of it. So, uh, yeah, the, the something common for, for other, you know, for, for creative reviews that, you know, I can at least, I can understand. You know, some say that the present day scenes are unnecessary and the movie is at least a little too long. I totally get it. And I actually, just a few days ago, I talked to someone who loves the movie and she's like, I haven't watched it in a while, because you gotta, you gotta really clear your schedule in order to have time to watch it, you know, and yeah, for sure that is, it means that you won't, you know, for a lot of us it means we won't watch it as frequently as, but I don't think it makes the movie bad. Now, let's see. See. But but yeah, for for sure. Like if you're someone who struggles with long movies, you know, I th I think I could understand having an easier time sitting still for like Lord of the Rings, for example. You know, th this and Das Boot and and other like if you're not really like. If you're not feeling it, if you're not really, really deep into, it might be too. And and honestly, I could imagine there probably are fan edits that remove the the present day stuff. And ultimately, the movie probably does play fine without them. I'm just not. I, I might try to watch at least once for like out of just just to see. But I'm happy with how the the length and pacing of the movie. So the thing I was most worried about was that the movie would end up being sappy, and honestly, like, I can understand people who disagree, but I didn't really find it to be sappy. It's definitely, it's emotional, but, like, sappy is bad. Emotional is just a descriptive neutral term when it comes to movies. I realize that it's considered negative when it's applied to people. Shouldn't be. It's, you know, we have emotions, but whatever. But, you know, sadly, it's often used as a... Um, a dog whistle for, you know, minorities. Uh, let's see, uh, you know, an excuse to not take seriously the concerns of minorities. Women and African Americans and such, for example. 
So, uh, yeah, before the first time I watched it, the thing I was most looking forward to was seeing what all the fuss was about. And, yeah, you know, like, I, I basically, in 2010, like, I sat down, I was like, look, I've watched everything else. All of it is worth, like, I don't know, like, The Abyss, if it comes to Disney+, Plus or I find a very cheap DVD or something... Yeah, I'll probably watch it at least once more and do a video review on it since, you know, if all goes well, in two weeks I'll be doing True Lies, and then The Abyss is literally the only movie that he has written or uh, that he has directed that I haven't done a video on. I would like to do a video on Strange Days. Uh, I'm looking for a, a cheap, uh, you know, copy so that I can... Because other than that, those, those are the only two movies of his that I haven't done videos, the, the, uh, fictional movies. I, I don't really review documentaries. I did watch the the documentary, you know, uh, let's see, I, two of the documentaries that he, he did, uh, or three? S several, because they're on Disney+. Plus. I did, I'm probably not going to review them. I don't really do reviews of, so, so, yeah. Let's see, but, but, yeah, um, you know, I sat down, I was like, I've watched everything else. I really, really dig everything else. It, it, yeah, I, I love, I love his movies. You know, it, it just and and really, I don't think I've ever heard. I've never heard a criticism of this movie that didn't boil down to historical inaccuracies. You know, it's it's emotional and like I don't like that James Cameron made a movie that is so much like you know big and and it is it is very different from what he made earlier but if you actually look at like there is you know there's there's mother daughter stuff in aliens there's like I guess I don't want to give away exactly what, but there's love stuff in the Terminator movies, you know, so he always does this. It's just a lot of the time there's like killer robots or space aliens or these kinds of things. And, you know, but, but yeah, you know, I, I've never, I've never heard a credible complaint of this movie that didn't boil down to one of those three and I just, I think it's ridiculous to criticize someone for making a movie that's unlike the other movies they've made. Unless they do a bad job, then it makes sense. You know, but saying this is different, just, that's that's capitalism for you. You know, people are like, I thought if I sat down to watch a James Cameron movie, I would get the same thing every time. I don't understand this. Why is he making something? I ordered a cheeseburger and you served me... This, like, you serve me tacos? I don't, I, I, this is completely incomprehensible to me. Because let's be honest, at the end of the day, his movies, you know, he's the, he's one of the people who make popcorn movies that are actually good, you know, the, that actually have flavor and where you don't, where you aren't hungry immediately after for another one, you know. So the, the, like, holy crap, the people who are like, oh, James Cameron made a different movie from what he usually does. If you ever try to, like, leave America, if you try to watch some European cinema, your head might literally explode, like, scanner style. But, but yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that his history is extremely important. And like I said, I do think it is a big deal that he made someone who was actually heroic look really awful but yeah those are the like i we really got to get better here in the west at expressing emotions and feeling emotions you know i i mentioned recently that you know when i was younger i met a number of you know muslim immigrants and some of them you know they they had a much easier time feeling and expressing emotions than, than some of us, you know, Western white people do. And, 
Like, it was very clear, like, it's, it's much, much healthier emotionally to be in touch with your emotions. Obviously, there are situations where you should be able to keep them under control, but the kind of... Yeah, I've, I've always thought that we need to get better at emotions, and, and that's... I mean, maybe it's part of... Like, when I was a very small child, it basically was just me and my parents... You know, I, I didn't, you know, my, my siblings are, are much older, so they weren't still living at home when, when I was born and, and growing up. And we've never had a problem. Like, um, I guess it is, like, you know, and, and maybe it helps that a lot of the emotions, like, we, we weren't, you know, yeah, when it's just, you know, a... A kid and his parents like you can express positive emotions without so much fear of ridicule as you know compared to if it's public but yeah you know I've never you know and I I before you hit the comments I know sometimes I show more emotion in my videos than some people are comfortable with and I respect that. That's, you know, but I, we really got to get better. You know, for sure, if you're like, people shouldn't be showing this much emotion when they're just talking into a camera on YouTube, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. But we should be able to share emotion. And, and you actually see, like, a lot of, a lot of young couples, like, they end up breaking up because the guy has suppressed his emotions for so many years that when he's with a woman, even if he does love her, even if he's, you know, he might love her, but he can't say, I love you. He might be really attracted to her, but he can't express it other than, you know, yeah, during sex and such. But, and, and yeah, a lot of women end up being like, I can't, I can't, this is not healthy for, for either of us. And, and they break up, and then a lot of these young men get mad at the women as if it was women who made the decision. It's, it's patriarchy. It's this absurd notion that men have to always be, you know, strong. And it's also just, I hate the notion that being strong emotionally means that you don't show emotion. That's absurd. Anyway, you know, it's not about not feeling emotion. It's not about not expressing emotion it's about channeling emotion into the right you know yeah if if you're if you're very upset about something you know try not to give up try to instead focus all of the the tension that there exists around that try to focus it into applying yourself and and you know unless it is something that you literally can't accomplish Now, let's see. And, and you know, in that case, try to process your emotions. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. The, t the trailers do give too much away. Um, it's difficult to, to convey enough, like, really interesting stuff about the movie without spoiling anything. Now, uh, some of the cover and posters do arguably give too much away. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where this has an 88 percent, based on 250 reviews, only 30 negative reviews, and the audience score is 69, nice, based on more than 250,000 ratings, and the average rating is 3.3 .3 out of 5, so that's not too bad. And yeah, the critics consensus, a mostly unqualified triumph for James Cameron, who offers a dizzying blend of spectacular visuals and old-fashioned melodrama. And let's see. on Metacritic, it has a 75 based on 35 critics, 26 positive, 6 mixed, 3 negative. Now, let's see, so the negative ones... Huh. 
yeah, it, the the um, yeah. So basically, the the three negative ones boil down to one of them thinks that the story and acting are bad, and I mean, I can I agree that the story is fairly straightforward, but I do not agree that it's bad. And certainly, the acting isn't bad, but anyway. And then, yeah, this, this one person says, it's completely derivative of old Hollywood romances. It lacks even minimal originality. I mean, the uh, case can be made. Yeah, I, I just don't think that's... so. Bad. And, and that's the thing, like, this is a, a movie critic. He's watched old Hollywood stuff. I don't think... Cameron was making the movie so much for people who had watched old Hollywood stuff and I've watched some old Hollywood stuff for sure there is some deriv der derivation going on and let's see yeah and one person says there's no sensitivity to the real to, to the handling of the real story and yeah I, I do think there is some truth to that the user score is 8.4 out of 10, based on 1,481 ratings. 1,283 of them are positive, 85 mixed, 113 negative. So, again, overwhelmingly positive reception. And on IMDb, it has a 7.9 out of 10 based on 1,208,200 IMDb users. 24.8 gave it 8, 23 gave it 10, 18.6 gave it 7, 16.5 gave it 9, 7.9 gave it 6, 3.6 gave it 5, 2.2 gave it 1. See, I, I got it. I feel like that's probably largely the people who do not like the emotion of the film. 1.7 gave it 4, 1.1 gave it 3, 0 0.8 gave it 2. There are currently 3,285 IMDb user reviews. If you hide spoilers, there's 2,718. And let's see. Yeah, I ended up not checking the links, but there are 257 links to external reviews on IMDb, and of the 100 most positive IMDb user reviews, 0 gave it 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10, or 4 out of 10, or 6 out of 10, 3 of them gave it 5 out of 10, 1 gave it 7, 7 gave it 8, 19 gave it 9, 70 gave it 10. This is, this is a very popular movie, is, is what we're discovering here. So the special effects, there's a lot of really impressive stuff on, on display. There is some CG that doesn't completely hold up, but they went practical whenever it wasn't impractical to do so. And the, the effects serve the story and atmosphere. They don't distract. There's no like, oh, look at what we can do. And the, let's see, there is weight and mass to the CG, and let's see, yeah, I would argue that to even notice the, the CG that doesn't hold up, you pretty much have to be looking for it, like, I didn't even notice it on this viewing, and I actually, I was trying to find it, I was like, wait, is it, no, no, that looked good, and, and just... Yeah, I've I've seen some people who managed to spot it. I I feel like they were they were looking extremely hard to find it and none of the bad effects are distracting, you know, which is it's it's rare for James Cameron's special effects to be distracting, especially distracting from not quite holding up. There's some excellent stunt work, like holy crap, some of the stunts in this really help sell. Effects and, and stunt work really sell the, the disaster, the, the how horrible the disaster was. Um, let's see, I think I want to... Yeah, so um, right now it looks like there's going to be three links in the uh, description 
box and there we go. <clears throat> so yeah, um, my personal rating is 10 historical romantic dramas out of 10. I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but I could watch this again later today. Like, it, even though it takes more than three hours, like, it's just, it's, you just, you want to spend more time with it. Not that it leaves you feeling like, ah, it wasn't quite enough, but just, yeah. It absolutely holds up, and, let's see, yes, so the, the rating, so yes, worst to best rating the movies that James Cameron has directed and keeping in mind I love all of them True Lies, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1 and yeah um yes this is my favorite disaster film that I've ever watched and to yeah the so yes, the, the top ones, the ones that I love are The Core, Ladder 49, The Poseidon Adventure from 72, The Andromeda Strain from 71, and this in that order. And that brings us to the thoughts section. So from here on out, we have spoilers for the movie. And I'm going to start with the section notes taken while watching. So we open in sepia tone of the ship leaving the dock, moving to natural color of the surface of the water, and then the exploration of the wreck. And yeah, at the start of the movie, Brock is a cynic. By the end, he cares. And the robot passes stuff that meant the world to people, and Brock and company only care about the safe. Someone left the water running. That's not helping. At first, they're disappointed the diamond was not in the safe, but they do find the drawing of Rose, puts it on TV, she contacts them. The same thing happened to Geraldo, and his career never recovered. He ended up on Fox News. Anyone willing to work for them is an awful excuse for a human being. And I love that he... Ah, crap, I didn't get his name, but Brock's right-hand man you know, says that, that Russian girl, Anastasia. And I really like the, it's been 84 years bit. Like, it really highlights how sassy Rose still is at age 101. Are you going to let me tell the story? Is, or is, do you want to hear the story or not? Look at that boat. It's a ship, Daddy. <sighs> Who gives a ship? When you've, got, when you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. You think you've got nothing to lose, but you haven't thought it through. You haven't thought about your lady friend down at the DA's office. You haven't thought about your old butler. I'm sorry, Fabrizio. You don't have to be sorry, Leo. You're doing the best you can. Cameron wrote the line. Who says you got top bunk? You snooze, you lose where you snooze. And Rose smokes, though her mother doesn't like it. And Cal takes the cigarette from her and orders lamb for her before he knows if she likes it, and I really like Molly calling out, you're gonna cut it for her too? <laughs> like she's a child or something, you know, just, yeah. And because of the Freud quip, he's going to control what she reads in the future. Holy crap, but yeah, the, the thing, and you know, she actually did read this thing, and this other guy, uh, Freud, is, is, what was it? I, I forget what his guess was, but he had no idea who Sigmund Freud actually was. And Jack talks her out of the suicide attempt by expressing concern for her and pointing out he would feel compelled to try to save her. In real life, some people do attempt or even commit suicide because they feel like their life will never be worth living, which is how Rose feels, and Jack, over the course of the movie, makes her love life. In addition to being part of her love life. And Cal says, what makes you think you can put your hands on my fiancé? Because he considers her his property. He, he barely even cares if she got hurt or not. He's just like, how, can, how dare you touch something that belongs to me? 20? That's the going rate for saving the love of your life? She makes a point. 
and Jack actually listens to Rose about her pain and problems. Straight men watching, wondering why IRL, IRL women don't seem to like you much? Take notes. And, you know, Jack asks, do you love him? And maybe she never actually wondered that question herself because she figured that she wouldn't be able to get someone she actually loved. Maybe it's the fact that he's asking it in such a public, not private place. But she starts insulting him and, yeah. I haven't quite been able to... I, I, I did some searching... Is one-legged prostitute a prostitute that literally only has one leg, or is it a euphemism for a trans person? Obviously, if the latter, it's kind of a transphobic joke. Let's see. Either way, it makes them both chuckle, I guess, at the idea that he had sex with her. And, you know, Ruth says, I'm paraphrasing, Why would a woman go to college if she already has a husband? She just does not see any other future for a woman. And they talk, and Jack gets Rose to hope for the future. My mother looked on him as a dangerous insect. Jack, beware the Borg Queen. Okay, so technically she she didn't play the Borg Queen. It was Alice Krieg and that other woman. But she looks a lot like... Let's see. Maybe she was auditioning for the Borg Queen here, because she really does hate Jack. And Molly gets Jack a suit that her son is not using right now. You know, when she isn't breaking Arthur's legs, she'd be downright nice. And Jack learns manners from looking at the rich people. Why, you could almost pass for a gentleman. Right back at you, buddy. I'm joking. The a-hole cow cannot pass for a gentleman. I saw this in a Nickelodeon once and wanted to do it. Hearing that, someone rushed to the IMDb goof section to point out that Actually, Nickelodeon, the TV channel, did not exist back then. Of course, the term Nickelodeon also refers to a device that allows people to watch short films, and that did exist back then. It's not great when you think you're correcting someone else's ignorance, only re reveal your own. Hello, Molly. And Ruth tries to make Jack look bad at dinner, but he acquits himself well. Acquitted himself well, okay. I don't know why it makes me chuckle when Jack casually tosses the matchbox to Cal, but it does. And Jack slips a small note to Rose, and they meet at the clock, just as they do later in The Dream or Afterlife, however you interpret that. And I really appreciate that when they meet in, in The Dream, he is wearing the stuff that, you know, the, the third-class passenger stuff. He's not wearing the suit, because that's not really him. That was something he wore so that he could be allowed into dinner, it's not really something that, you know, like, he looked, he looked good in it, he looked good in it, but it's not him, it's not, and, and she's in love with Jack the person, not Jack the guy who can pass for first class. Great energy to the lower decks, and great contrast between it and the rich men talking politics, I haven't done that in years. He's making her feel so alive, and we fade from the fun of the party scene to the boredom and tension of having tea with Cal, who's furious that she danced with Jack, and the corset tightening scene, you know, great metaphor, the, con the constraint of living the life others have planned for her. You know, like, they could have... They could have filmed a million different things as a part of, you know, oh, she's getting dressed like it's not like her putting socks on or something because that's not really but tightening a corset that's a really great uh, yeah ruth expresses fear that they will live in poverty the greatest fear for many rich people is no longer being rich and ultimately even a little bit of empathy for rose having to conform and we're told that the only positive thing rose's father left them was the name that's why they still have status most people don't know that the money is gone and only see the name, and that is, you know, sadly, I mean, that is one of the things that someone like Donald Trump, you know, if people knew how bad he was at business, you know, before he ran for president, then, you know, and it's for sure some people knew, but he was able to trick many, and it was because of a TV show that made, you know, that used his name and his, his face and his horrible, horrible words.
But yeah, in other words, it is in fact a man's fault that these women are poor. It's not a character flaw of theirs, as is so often claimed when someone is not wealthy. Lovejoy is fine with paying Jack to stay away from Rose, but Jack doesn't want the money. He wants to be with Rose, and he certainly isn't going to take money to be away from her. So instead, he pays to have Jack removed. Now that Jack is no longer in a fancy suit, they won't allow him in. It's not the man they judge, it's the veneer. You know, like, logically, they should not They should let Jack in, but not Cal. Let's see. And the flying, flying scene fades to present day. Everything he knows is wrong. Okay, Weird Al. That's a great song, though. I really appreciate the drawing scene is not male gaze. It actually fades to present day, so we focus on Rose the person, not Rose the way she used to look, and what it's meant to Rose the person. It sure took Lovejoy long to take the cab, and I feel like that would be one of the first places to look. And Rose not only consents to sex, but actually initiates it. She's not the only James Cameron heroine this is true of. It's very clear he thinks it is not wrong for women to take the initiative. And see. yeah, and Cal sees the book of drawings, becomes certain that she's cheating. So yeah, we're about halfway through the movie when the iceberg is hit. And the third class of, has water on the floor, even in the rooms. The first floor just noticed the engine and stopped. They felt the ship move weirdly. Another area where the poor are more exposed to danger. And that is, like, you know... In, in today's society, a lot of the people who are the most exposed to danger for stuff like, if, you know, the, the um, yeah, oil and polluted water and such, a lot of the people who are most exposed to that are working class, poor people. It doesn't really affect the rich people. So, so, yeah, I feel like this movie could maybe put in the back of the head of, of a number of people that, yeah. I appreciate the detail that Jack and Rose are worried about the emergency. Cal and Lovejoy care more about the affair. And Lovejoy plants the jewel. And Cal would rather yell at Rose than take it seriously when he's being told there's something, like, you have to deal with this. Let's see. And, and, you know, it's too cold and noisy for them. Wow. Rose is the first first-class passenger to realize there's something serious. Poor Jack Bristow. He really does mean well. He just sometimes makes some decisions that hurts people that he didn't mean to. Shut up, mother. Seriously. Half the people on this boat are going to die. Not the better half. You know, Cal... That might not have been the best thing to say in the current circumstances. Supremely satisfying when Rose spits in Cal's face and says she would rather be Jack's W word than Cal's wife. I know, I know, I know, I know. So you know. Super tense when she uses the axe. And, and the thing with, like, you know, okay, hit it there. Okay, try to hit the same spot and she hits completely. That's enough practice. <laughs> Hit it hard and fast. That's what she said. You'll have to pay for that. Shut up! <laughs> Short of when Picard said shut up to Wesley, this is like some of the most satisfying characters saying shut up to just, yeah. And they break the gate. It sure was good that the two lead characters showed up so that something could be done. Music to drown by. Now I know I'm not first class. Yeah, really. And Cal claims he's going to get Jack on a lifeboat. And Jack knows that it isn't, but he wants Rose to have hope. And Rose jumps out of her lifeboat and is back with Jack, which is super whack. They put the coat on her! So funny to see him lose his temper. Also really shows it wasn't really a gift, so much as a way for him to show off. If he can't have her, he wants his diamond back. But just, like, so much of the time, he's got this very manner, very careful way of speaking, and he doesn't express very much emotion, except to occasionally point out oh, that Pablo Picasso will never amount to anything. But when it comes to the diamond, 
first he chuckles that he put the diamond on he put the diamond in the coat I put the coat on her <laughs> just so satisfied Billy Zane nails it like just so awful and Cal grabs Lovett's gun apparently this was supposed to originally be that Cal paid Lovett to go and shoot them and I think it was maybe David Warner who told James Cameron no one is going to do that for money. Like, I appreciate the, the anti-capitalist messaging here, but no one is going to run into a sinking ship and start shooting at people just for money, you know. But Cal would, you know, James Cameron, like, there's only so... We have to bear with James Cameron. He struggles to make an entire movie without at least one character firing at least one gun. And... Like other James Cameron movies, the gun does not magically have infinite ammo. In fact, I believe, did, did I think he fires seven shots, which is exactly, that. that is how, much, how many bullets there would be in that type of gun. So, yeah. And, and the couple try to save the check, according to the subtitles for the father's exclamation kid. And then the movie tries to kill any epileptics watching. And... The gate is locked. And they convince the guy working there to try to be an ambassador instead of a gatekeeper. And Cal spots a kid, only comes back to save the kid after he realizes his money can't... Your money can't save your life anymore that it can save mine. And the old couple embrace on the bed, accepting their death. The mother reads a bedtime story to the kids. You know, the... She knows that they're not going to survive. She doesn't want them to despair in her dying moments. And I think that might be Jeanette Goldstein there. You know, very nice of Jim Cameron to make her appear to be a much better mother here than she did in Terminator 2, although I guess this is one of those only the biological parent can be good parents thing. See, certainly if the biological parents are still alive. Yeah, actually, maybe I guess maybe it's the system. He's saying that the system places children with bad adoptive parents, but just, yeah. I need a knife. He eats apples to cope with stress. And... But, but yeah, seriously, though, some of these scenes near the end, like, holy crap, they really get to you. Like, yeah, as, you know, I... I try not to cry during movies because I appear on camera so soon after, and I fear it would be distracting to let's see there we go distracting to viewers it was if it was very clear that i had recently cried this movie does make it very hard to not cry and yeah to be clear there's absolutely nothing wrong with crying i'm not saying that i never cry and if this or any other or none at all movie game tv show etc did or didn't for that matter make you cry you shouldn't feel bad about it crying is healthy and normal Gentlemen, it's been a privilege to play with you tonight. And we see a priest pray. Great, the light goes out. That's so annoying. The falling deaths hit very hard. And we see dozens of people in the water. It's so cold. I have a suggestion, but you're not going to like it. And it's not going to last long. And Molly, you know, compels the, the you know, yeah. The, the boats to, to return to the others, and we see the the people who who freeze to death, fro frozen to death. I love you, Jack. As a friend, seriously though, if, if if a woman says that to you, try to consider if maybe there's something about you that's not super appealing, instead of blaming her and getting mad at her. And they check the bodies, and... Yon Griffith is very compelling, even though he has very little screen time. Like, I could believe that people watch this movie and were like, okay, I don't know who that guy is. Get me his name. I want to make, what was it, like eight movies that he stars in. So just, yeah. And we see, you know, we realize Jack died not very long before they were rescued. And, you know, she, she's too weak to, to cry out, but she, she can whistle. And it pans across all the present-day people. And, you know, at the start, they were all cynical, and now they're crying from the... Just, yeah. 
and we hear about you know they had to wait on the the boats and you know we see the the they get um they get onto the that other ship i yeah i already forgot the name of it but that was the ship that they said earlier it can be here in four hours but you know we know the you know the ship will have sunk within about two two and a half hours or something like that you know so so yeah you know of course it showed up in time to, to save the ones that were in lifeboats and and not like wounded or something and you know we see some of them struggle to find their loved ones and it's just it's heartbreaking you know this this woman who's like I mean he this is what he looks like and and the the guy's like I, I'm sorry but this is this is you know oh, no, he's got like a list and he's like I'm, I'm sorry they're, they're, you know no one by that name is on the list and she's like Maybe he's maybe he's on another boat, you know. Just yeah, that that's probably yeah. So you know, that's probably the thing that got the most to me. This this thing of being being told, I'm sorry, they they must not have made it, and simply not being willing to accept that yet. You know, I, I it's it's very moving the ones who did accept. But but this woman who, you know, has been waiting for, for hours in, in these, you know, boats, and then she comes on and she's told, no, he, you know, I think it was a he, but the person you're looking for must not have made it. And, you know, Cal walks into, you know, the, the guy says, there's no one of yours here. This, these are only people from steerage. You know, the, the assumption... And it's true in Cal's case is a, a rich person can't possibly because because if Cal cared about them they would be in first class you know he would make sure that they were in first class he has the money for that yeah I you know there there must not be anyone there and and you know Rose manages to hide and we're told that he shot himself after the crash in twenty nine. <coughs> And yeah, Brock admits I never let it in before. And Rose tosses the the stone. Now some people have said, you know, I get that you didn't want to make a living off of something Cal gave you, but couldn't it maybe now now that Cal is dead anyway, could you maybe like sell it and it could help the the you know yeah. And and yeah, I can't really I'm not here to argue with with those very very logical arguments, but it is emotionally satisfying, in my opinion, that that's what she does. And I really love the near the end where you know she gets into the the dream or afterlife, and like the camera, let's see, I think it like travels up to the the hull of the of the sunk Titanic, and then like. Yeah, it, it like goes into and then it fades and slowly like the, the damage is is removed and it's actually it's made very you know, it looks like it did in its prime on this million voyage, and she goes up to the door and oops and, and everyone is there and it's very, very sweet. And that brings us to the final section of this video. Notes taken before watching so yes i wanted to start with something from the i'm to be frequently asked questions could jack have fit on the floating door with rose the most famously asked question the answer is still hotly debated however if you watch the film closely the film does provide an answer once jack helps rose onto the door he tries to climb up as well but the door flips over and dumps them both back into the water, which is why Jack doesn't try to get on the door again. Even if he did manage to get aboard the door, it would likely have been partially submerged, defeating the purpose and compromised the film's message about living life to the fullest. I I think most of the people who argue over this and, and say, oh, they, they could have made it, they're just trying to... They, they don't want to admit that maybe it made them feel, or maybe it didn't make them feel, that's fine too. But like, it's written 
very specifically for, you know it's not an issue of how much space there is it's an issue of buoyancy it's not at all like you could say that you think it should have been that but to say that the movie should just have had that like they would have to remove the the bit that shows clearly that they couldn't both be on it you know just no i i completely disagree that the movie would in any way be better than the by that choice so uh right some credit quotes Early on, the sweeping camera is admiring the beauty of the ship. Once it starts sinking, the camera is providing an omnipotent perspective on the horrible tragedy. In part due to the way disaster movie scenes are shot, a nightmare to work on, yes, but it's all up on the screen. It feels real. It's gripping. Let's see. The... Uh... So the, the, yeah, this, this was a review from 2015. This person gave it a three out of 10. Maybe the most overrated movie ever. Special effects meet a dopey screenplay, bad acting. The plot, Kate Winslet's boyfriend gets her the biggest diamond in the world, takes her to NYC in the biggest state room and the biggest ocean line in the world. She pays him back by banging a guy from steerage in front of all his friends. This guy really needs to look into what in front of means because that is not like it's true that people realize that it happened, but it wasn't in front of like that just I really hate when people try to redefine words to make something sound either better or worse than it is like she spat in his face in front of everyone, but she didn't have sex in front of everyone. The only disappointment is that she didn't go down with the boat. Love story, only if you think someone who cheats is a heroine. Reviews like that are why we need movies like this. The fact that Cal literally drives Rose to attempt suicide does not make this reviewer empathize with her. Here's hoping every woman this guy pursues can immediately pick up how much of a misogynist he is and avoids him. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. One person says James Cameron doesn't let the British shine. This is an American movie. That's very true. And uh, yeah, this person didn't like the, the reference. Uh, yeah, I'll just read. He can't resist the urge to do those cutesy references to the era of the film. And aren't we all so clever looking back knowing who Picasso is while the benighted fools aboard think he's doomed to be a starving artist? And this, this review fascinates me. Titanic has some romance, nudity, and is more of an adventure film than anything. That I hope stays sunk and never gets a sequel. Which I doubt. Uh, which I doubt it because this film was bad enough. I don't think the quality is why we haven't gotten a sequel. And if, you know, if you want to be technical, um, there is... Let's see... There is something called Titan. Yeah, there's there's multiple things called Titanic Two and yeah, um, there was yeah there was a 2010. Oh, Bruce Davison, could you not have? I don't know. I guess his career was struggling at the time, but yeah. A century after the fateful voyage of the original modern luxury liner Titanic Two set sail, will this ship suffer the same fate as her namesake? Because I guess some people couldn't get into the movie because it wasn't set in present day or I don't know I really don't understand why oh Hedbrook Burns yeah I think I don't I'm not sure sh her career was doing super well at the time she was great on Married with Children very very uh, funny but the um, yeah so let, let's see that's one of them and there's something in 2017 but it's a yeah, it's a it's a short comedy that's like um but it's probably some kind of yeah, so it's probably like a, a parody of the idea. And there's something called Titanic two thousand Vampire's Lust is unsinkable, so that's a thing. 
I remember seeing a, a trailer for something called Titanic 666, which came out like last year, direct to streaming or TV or something. Titanic 666, dark forces from the deep rise to the surface, terrorizing all aboard from Titanic 3 and threatens to repeat one of history's greatest disasters. Because if there's one thing that was needed in the Titanic movie story, Annalyn McCord? Was her career, is her career that in the toilet that she needs to do? Anyway. Um, yeah, and absolutely nobody else that I know from anything is in this movie. Um, yeah, for sure. If, if Titanic needed something, it was a ghost story or something of some kind of, based on the trailer, it looked like ghosts are just, yeah. So technically, if, you know, depending on how you want to look at it, maybe you could count that as a scene. Anyway, so back to my own notes. After Rose spends hours at the dinner table, dinner table, as it becomes ever clear that her life will no longer be her own, she has to be a lady. She will belong to Cal. She decides that death is preferable and would have gone through with it if not for the fact that Jack presents a light at the end of the tunnel, and by the end of the movie, we see that she did have an amazing life, just like Jack inspired her to do. Men can help women, but it's not healthy for her for it to be a financially dependent relationship. Rather, it should be that the man helps the woman self-actualize. And I think that's also something that a number of young men absolutely hated about this, because they think to themselves, if I'm not, if, if, if I want to be with a woman, I would have to be Cal. I would have to offer money. I can't be Jack. It's, you know, the, I, I can't... A woman can't herself... Like, just, just yesterday, I was, like, browsing Reddit, and apparently someone said that women don't develop hobbies on their own. It will always be something that an, an ex-boyfriend introduced to her when they were you know, together, it's just, and, and thankfully that person got roasted, but it's just, it's ridiculous, like, some, some men just have no empathy for women. Now, the movie is a classic tragedy. Going into it, we know things will go badly. That doesn't make it boring, it makes it more poignant. It is true that Kate is seen partially naked, but the character is not sexualized against her will. She chooses to be intimate with Jack. He makes her feel special, appreciated, she trusts him. It's meaningful, not gratuitous, and once they do actually have sex, it's not male gaze. We can tell it was mutually pleasurable. Her hand on the window implies that she climaxes. And the... Um, let's see, what was the other thing that I wanted to say? Yeah, yeah, think about how easy it would have been if the two, if, if the if the guys who were looking for her, when they got to the car, if they if the couple were still in there, that would be, you know, sexualizing her against her will. They would see her, you know, naked, which, you know, yeah, the the you know obviously, yeah, you know, you wouldn't want strangers to to see you naked like that. But Cameron specifically wrote that they got out of the car and got away from it before that. You know, when they're seen after sex, they're dressed again. <clears throat> Cal apparently wants to cheer up Rose, so he gives her something really expensive, as if he's buying her happiness. To him, everything is transactional. He doesn't say something to her that makes her feel loved. He isn't physically affectionate. Not that she wants that, but I doubt he'd give it if she did. He doesn't try to listen to what she might have to talk about that's bothering her. He doesn't love her. He just thinks he owns her or will in the future. He's dealing with her like he would if his car broke down. Like, throw some money at it, try to fix it. Let's see. And... Let's see. Yeah, so I appreciate that, you know, Rose could have gone back to Cal... At the end, you know, she chooses not to, to marry him. He can't find her afterwards. She hides from him. She cannot take down patriarchy and capitalism, but that doesn't mean that she has to let them control her. You know, it's not quite saying, you know, we need to overthrow 
you know, patriarchal and capitalism, but it is saying a lot of women suffer under it. It's really good that the movie has empathy for the poor from Jack and the others on Lower Decks, and at least some of them are not white, acknowledging how badly non-whites are treated in America, how many of them are forced to do hard labor, uh, like I mentioned earlier, really literally what keeps the ship going, and so many of them died. A lot of survivors were not third class, but it is pretty messed up that Rose basically becomes a poverty tourist. Like, once the ship has started sinking, and, and once the ship has started sinking, she even demands one of the guys take her down the elevator rather than just quickly getting instructions since it seems very easy to run those elevators. She's just still throwing her weight around as an upper class person. She also punches in the face a guy trying to get her safely out of there. And I really, like, I don't... I get that they're supposed to not take the elevator up. But, like, if she just... Like, as far as I can tell, all you have to do is pull that lever to the floor you want to go to and then open the doors and that's it, you know. Why didn't she just say, how do I, you know, yeah, how, how do I run this elevator? And then he can quickly say, you know, took, took me a few seconds, pull the lever to the floor you want to go to, then you can open the door, you know. And because if you don't want them to be able to take the elevator back up, just have it be that instead of it going back up, once she gets, you know, out of... Let's see. Yeah, when, when she gets to when she gets back there, or wait, or does she go in a different direction? Anyway, once she leaves the elevator, just have something. Yeah, maybe like a maybe it shortens short circuits or something. Uh, you know, maybe the the. Um, let's see. Yeah, just have have some visual instead of her telling someone that he has to take her down to where. They might drown. It's just, yeah, and I don't know. I maybe I missed something, but I didn't really get like she goes on to live her life to the fullest. But did she actually become like an altruist? Um, I mean, she's not like super rich in her old age, but just I don't know. I I I, I think that the movie could have had the just yeah. And, and, you know, ultimately, it is it is one of those things, like, it's, um, as criticized of, of white feminism, focusing on the problems of white women and not, like, others. Because, like, the, the life that, I'm not going to claim, you know, I'm sure her life would have been really, really painful if she had married Cal. But once she didn't... Like, it seems like, and, and you know, she did, she did come to empathize with these third-class people. So, you know, maybe they could have had something about how the, the you know, she did all that she could to, you know, to help the people who, you know, lower class, you know, whether back right after the Titanic sank, or in in more present day, but just some, and yeah, you could you could very easily have had like just when she gets onto the ship, like have her encounter, you know, someone that is like lower class, and have like her talk to them and make them feel seen, and just like have and yeah, you could you could have Brock like what what is this woman doing, and and just you know they they and they move on and the the third you know, the lower class person, like, smile, and, and maybe at the very end of the movie, you know, approach Brock and be like, you, you, I demand a raise, you, you should be treating me better, and, and Brock could be like, okay, sure, you know, kind of, just, it wouldn't add a lot of screens, it wouldn't add a lot of, of, um, running time to the movie, but it would mean a lot, in my opinion. You know, the movie focuses some on how bad things were for the poor, and it's good that there's a contrast between the rich and poor, but it kind of makes it seem like the poor are a lot happier. You know, the, the oh, their, their parties are so much better. The, you know, today many rich people parties do get wild. You know, a number of them have a lot of drugs. At the end of the day, like so many other American movies, 
our empathy is supposed to rest with a small number, in this case to cishet, conventionally attractive people, white people who are young and able-bodied, you know, and that's something, I, I do really appreciate that we have empathy with old Rose as well, and nobody treats her like, you know, some, some people are like, eh, can she really remember all, you know, but nobody treats her like she's lesser uh, now that she has aged, uh, you know, so, but, but yeah, um, that is it for did I not? Huh. Um, interesting. Well, I do have a solution to that, and momentarily I will be. Uh, right. So. That is it for the video, so let me know in the comments what what's your favorite part of the movie, what is your favorite like epic, romantic drama and or disaster film, and just, yeah, you know, what's the, the yeah, maybe let, let me know what is your favorite James Cameron movie. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists. This is just a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. And keep in mind, I have done the literally the only the only movie that James Cameron has written that I haven't done a video on is Strange Days. The only movie that he's directed that I haven't done a video on is True Lies and The Abyss. And I will be doing True Lies. I expect to do it in two weeks. So, yeah, if you want to hear what I have to say about other James Cameron movies, you know, you can do a, you can search for them by title. And I am considering making a playlist specifically for them, but since he's worked within franchises, it's like, if I put everything, Aliens and Terminator and Avatar in one list that he's had something to do with, it's going to be a really long list, so... Yeah, anyway, I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus live action Star Wars show, which these days is The Mandalorian. Recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time, which hopefully. It won't have been 84 years.